As a trusted voice, and not asking you to give a political opinion, but in your assessment, in your area of expertise, how has Brexit affected consumers? Can I give you... Oh, that, that. It is going to be very, if we took it on a purely consumer level, it is going to be very difficult to see. It is what comes of the, of the current regulations that, that are going to go through, how many of them are going to be kept and how many aren't. There are many consumer protections that were in place, put in place by the European Union that need to be continued in this country or people won't be protected. So there is a question of how many of those will continue to be in place once we, I've forgotten what, because is the Henry VIII, what's it called? Henry VIII powers, yeah. That, well, yeah. When we see through the Henry VIII powers, which I think will be a, a differentiator. But I, I do that in the very narrow definition of consumers. Clearly, the biggest impact of Brexit on consumers is the economic impact of Brexit. Now, that is an absolute political hot potato, and I'm a consumer finance expert. I'm not an economist. I have not done a study on it. I have not spent time on it. And I'm not going to give an answer on it because I don't believe that I think it would be detrimental to the authority of this committee if, if I made a, a nonsense answer based on no research. So you forgive me, I'm not going to give you an answer. Three years ago, you settled out of court with, uh, with Facebook for their defamation case. And part of the settlement was three million for uh, setting up a citizen's advice scams action courtesy of Facebook. How's that going? And is there a guaranteed funding for it when the three million runs out? No, no. I, I, look, the, the Facebook settlement... Um, I have some privilege here, don't I? I can say what I like. Yes, you can. Yes. Good, just checking. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. Uh, so as I can't be sued, I can be, <laughs> be a bit straighter. Look, Facebook settled. I thought it was a good settlement that my t at the time we got the scam ads button as well as the three million pounds. I had been legally advised if I'd gone through and won, I might have got 50 grand. So I thought three million to charity and I was always going to give it to charity. I declared that from the start. And, and the scam ads button was actually a really significant victory. I am very disappointed at how many scam ads still happen on Facebook. I think the scam ads button has not worked nearly as well. I don't think the resources have been put in. I think Citizens Advice Scam Action is going to end up with no funding soon because I have met the other big tech companies and frankly they are not interested in funding the victims of scams which they are culpable parties to in my view. You can, I mean the number of those scams, the torrent of scams that are consistently out there. The number of IT experts who say they could write code in five seconds to get rid of them. It is simply a question of resource. You know, these are multi-billion pound companies. And when I, when I went to meet them, the first presentation they gave me was an hour long, and I've always wanted to say this, so it's nice to be able to do it, it was an hour long presentation. And they start on the technical difficulties of dealing with scam ads. After three minutes, and this was in a legal meeting, I said, stop, stop. I'm not interested in your, forgive me, in your technological bollocks. Right, uh, what I want... Oh, so he can't say... I, I apologise for my oh, language, I Chair. Yeah. I will you take that. I'm not interested in your technological boulder dash. Yeah. Baloney, or any other B words. Um, I... What... If you can't solve it technically, then you need to solve it manually. Then every single advert that you print, that you put on here, should simply be taken down manually. The issue of your technology and the idea that you have defined as having to have a technological solution <coughs> to scams that destroy people's lives, mental health and finances and leave people in a hideous situation and are absolutely incredibly destructive. The idea that it has to be a technological solution is simply wrong. If you can't, this is a function of your profits. You're going to have to take a hit to the income that you have, which is enormous and vast. And so I refuse to accept that. But, you know, you only have... Look, I, I, am, I am one person, and I met a very senior member of government about this, who said to me before this, we're very glad you are taking this case because we think it's easier for you to do that for, than for us to regulate on how to stop this, which I was really frustrated by. I thought it's very nice of you to, you know, to take the risk with my person and my, me, my personal having to take the risk. But as the face it was happening to all the time, I had to find a way to stop it. I should just note on record, this was not about me and the terms of the settlement always had to involve stopping all scam ads 
with trusted faces, not just scam ads with me and with trusted faces. And I think, um, I think um, government has abrogated its responsibility over the last five to six years with this continued amount of scams. And yes, we have the online safety bill, which will not cover all scam ads, but it is far better. And that's going to come in when? 2024, 2025 in practical terms? And how many people are going to be scammed in the meantime? I sued Facebook settlement was three years ago. The case started way before that. The scam ad started way before that. And perhaps as we're here on trust, maybe part of the trust is I pulled my finger out and did it off my own back and th this House and Parliament is still dilly-dallying over getting something that is transparently in the public interest, stopping scam adverts to vulnerable people, and it still hasn't been done three years later, and it probably won't be done for another two years, which probably is where the, you know, the lack of trust might well come from and the frustration from the public. Have you ever experienced anyone who could, uh, tries to imply that you're not a trusted source? All the time, of course. <clears throat> from... From social people? media all the time. Look, there is no one... But uh, anyone in government or anyone... I've got to be slightly careful about I was I was informed at somebody at, recently who was doing this and who was casting aspersions and making defamatory comments about me. Um, I was informed by a newspaper. Uh, part of my problem is some of the comments were so without... I didn't even understand the point of saying them. Um, and... Uh, uh, I didn't want the newspaper to print those comments because, of course, if you say, let's make something up, I'm an arsonist, there we go, I'm not an arsonist. If you say, <laughs> I was accused of being an arsonist, then, and you, but of course that's not true, then what people go, there's bound to be something in it, it's probably started a fire somewhere. So I, you know, I, in the end, the, the story wasn't printed because the news agenda moved on. But yes, I have had people in senior levels members of government cast aspersions over my over the level that I can what be trusted. What do you think the motive with that, for that would be? Well, the, the, the motive on this one was pretty clear because uh, they, <coughs> they thought that what I was saying was not in the, the interests of the person they were promoting for a leadership campaign. Um, good morning. Um, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by the slight dichotomy that, that you said in, in, I think, the answer to the first question, uh, that you're biased and you accept that you have biases, that we all have biases, and yet being interviewed even when you're being interviewed as a campaigner, you are, you are treated as an oracle uh, by programs, I mean, things like the Today program, I've, I've heard you being interviewed, and they don't challenge you in a way they would challenge any of us or even more government minister. D does that, in an odd way, worry you that, that everything you say is, is taken as sort of tablets of stone, even when you are expressing a bias? So let me, I'm not sure I agree with the premise that I'm not challenged and I have felt challenged on many occasions when I've given interviews. However, remember, my bias is declared and open that I, and I am introduced as somebody who is on, uh, for, comes from a consumer perspective. Um, so if you take it within that perspective, people know what I'm arguing. And I'm quite careful when I'm asked questions about cross, you know, so people, they will always... I'm talking about energy they will always ask me about the energy supply situation you know what's going on in international energy markets and my answer is I don't know I'm not an expert now that's probably something I can do that you can't you know I can simply say it's not my subject area I'm not going to give you an answer because I don't believe it's appropriate to do so um, I'm not sure where the challenge would necessarily come from because I you know I, I'm not a politician they don't have to push the other side with me. I am coming from a consumer perspective. If they want to argue what the impact on business is, I would happily answer that. But I come from, I think, you need, my, my definition of bias is bias on a pro-consumer basis. So I'm coming from a very specific and declared agenda base. So I'm not sure what the challenge necessarily is on that, apart from to say, well, you're not representing, you're, you're not representing business and the economy. Well, I'm not, and I'm not suggesting I would. If I were to come out tomorrow and say I'm Tory Lib Dem Green, SNP, Plaid Cymru, and any others you want to name, let's not, you know, right? If I, and say I think you should vote that way, instantly everybody who does not think that way would discount my opinion. And I think the right way to be, and to be fair, I have not voted for the same party at every general election in my lifetime. 
So I don't, I'm not tribal. I'm not a member of a party. I try and do what I do from a level of independence and lack of bias. Although, as I always say, that is not a perfect art. And I think if I did, I'd instantly lose any trust that people have. And it has been very difficult over this last year when I felt I had to stick my head above the political parapet on, on energy. You know, I never attack political parties, but I will, when it's a specialist area that I believe in, attack a policy. And I put my head above on energy and was very vocal on the fact that I thought that people may die this winter unless we started to put some protections in place. And obviously the, the zombie government we had in the summer was devastating for not making a decision in time and the structure of the way that that operated was devastating. And it, it, you, you question how far do I go? How far do I, how, how much is that getting big P political? Small P political I'm fine with, big P political I'm not, party political. And it is a very difficult line to tread, to be honest. When you, want, when, when you believe in something passionately and it's not agendered against a party. I've worked with uh, all parties uh, and, and often do and it, and it works very well and I find most people are really receptive. But sometimes you, you will be seen as being pushing one way or the other and it's difficult.